Welcome to video five of six. In this video, we're going to be looking at theme five, which is finance. If this is the first time you've checked out one of these videos, what we'll be doing is going through some elements of knowledge, then you will have the opportunity to practice some questions. Ideally, you will stop the video for each question and then after you've written your answer, check against the commentary and the mark scheme. This video is not a complete replacement for you doing your own work. I have not got time to cover every single element within the specification in one video. So please make sure you have completed the relevant knowledge organizer and you've done your own revision from your revision guide or from your own workbooks from school. So let's look at the role of the finance department. The finance department is all about managing the income and expenditures throughout the business. You can view finance as a mirror to the different activities that go on in the other different functional areas. It will be responsible for financial planning, budgeting, investment decisions, and giving advice to managers in different functional areas. The finance department is also responsible for reproducing various different financial reports. You will have to work out elements of profit and ratios. You will have to look at cash flow and you will have to do some break even analysis. The finance department is also responsible for making sure that the laws that govern finance are followed within the business. That could include producing data that has to go to the taxman or to actually input information onto the annual report, which could be a legal requirement depending upon the ownership type of the company. Let's now look at sources of finance. Clearly, sources of finance refers to where a business can access different types of money. There are two basic ways that a business can get additional money. That is through internal sources or through external sources. Internal sources come from a variety of different areas, including personal savings. This is particularly important for startup businesses and small businesses such as sole traders and partnerships. An advantage of using your own money, your own personal savings, is that it's available immediately and you're not having to pay anyone interest for the use of it. However, particularly if you're a small business, you might not have enough money for all of the funds that you need. Retained profits is another good source of internal finance. But please remember, and this is a common trick that um, exam boards do, a new business will not have any retained profits. It is only businesses who have been established for a while that may have built up profits that it can use. Again, you're not having to pay interest on these profits. They are there. You're not having to ask anyone for it. But if you do use your profits, maybe you're putting away money for a rainy day, which will no longer be available. Sale of assets is another method businesses can use to raise money. If you are no longer using a building or a piece of equipment, then selling that can give you cash that you can invest in further developments for your business. External sources of finance include bank loans. In this case, you would go to your bank and you would ask for a fixed amount of money over a certain period of time. You will have to pay back the initial loan plus interest. Overdrafts are when a bank will allow you to use more funds than you actually own. These are short term solutions to financial problems. And again, you do pay interest on them. And the interest is often higher than you would have set for a bank loan. Trade credit doesn't come from a bank, it comes from your suppliers. This is where they allow you to use the goods before you pay them. Certain businesses will be able to access this 
established businesses with a good relationship with a client will be offered trade credit more readily than a new business with no history with that supplier. Grants come from governments or councils or other organisations. They are non-repayable, which is a good thing, but you are not just given the money. There's an application process which has to go through and you have to use that money specifically for what it has been allocated to you for. Venture capitalists are external investors who are available to give money and sometimes advice to help your business grow. Again, in exchange for the money, they want some say in the business and that could mean you have to give up partial ownership of your business to them. Leasing from other companies is often a good idea if you are short of money and not able to buy your own equipment. Leasing means you are renting the equipment for a period of time. A plus side of that is if there's anything that goes wrong with that equipment, the lease company will replace it or repair it. That is not a responsibility you have to pay for. On the downside, you never get to own that piece of equipment. Finally, crowdfunding. Now, there are lots of different versions of crowdfunding, but this is generally where you are asking small investors to contribute an amount of money to launch a business venture or launch a new product for an existing business. Again, it is important you look at the different types of crowdfunding because they do vary. We've already talked about some advantages and disadvantages of the different sources of finance. And there is no wrong or right source of finance that a business should choose. Businesses need to be careful when they are picking the right source of finance. How costly is it going to be? Are they going to give up some ownership? What is the interest rate? Is it a short term need or a long term need? All of these things will influence the decision the business makes. Now look at section 5.3, revenue costs, profit and loss. Revenue is the total income earned by a business from selling its goods and services. You calculate that by multiplying the number of goods by the selling price. Costs is the total sum of money that a business pays out. You've got direct costs, the costs of making the good, and you've got indirect costs. Those are things that have to be paid whatever, such as salaries, um, electricity bills, etc. We break down costs into fixed and variable. Fixed costs are the same no matter what quantity is produced. So you have, for example, a set amount of rent that you have to pay for the building. That is the same no matter if you are producing 1,000 units or zero units. And then variable costs change when the amount of products you make increases or decreases. This is mainly labour costs that are waged labours and raw materials. When we talk about profit, you need to know the difference between gross profit and net profit. So gross profit is calculated by taking the cost of goods sold from total revenues. This does not include your overheads. Gross profit measures the manufacturing efficiency of the production processes. Net profit, on the other hand, takes all of the costs into account. So it is the cost of goods sold and the expenses that you incur from your rent bill, etc. When we look at the profit margin, you are dividing the profit by revenue. Let's move on to a little bit of financial planning and forecasting. Businesses 
have to adapt to the dynamic market they operate in. And part of that would be planning and trying to forecast what their sales could be and how many products they need to sell to break even. Being able to calculate a break even point is really important. That is where total cost equals total revenue. Above that point, the business knows it will start to create profits. Below that point, it will be making a loss. So having an understanding of how many products they need to sell is important, particularly if you are trying to attract new investors. And your break even analysis would form part of a business plan. If you don't know what a business plan is, then you will find that information in the first video of this series. The formula for break-even is fixed costs divided by selling price per unit minus the variable cost per unit. You can either calculate it or you could draw the information on a graph. The calculation is the most accurate way to calculate the break-even point because when you start drawing with pens and paper, inaccuracies can creep in. I've already said that when the break-even point is calculated, that can be used to help a business make some decisions. But there are limitations with the break-even point. For example, it assumes that every product you make is sold. It assumes that your costs remain the same. It assumes that you're not going to give discounts to businesses who may want to buy in bulk. Any of those elements can actually make the break-even point that you have calculated incorrect. However, it is still a useful tool for a business to calculate its likelihood of making a profit based upon the number of items it can sell. Let's move on to section 5.5, cash and cash flow. Now, cash is the amount of currency that a business has available. It doesn't mean it has to have cash in tins in the office, but it means that it could go to the bank and withdraw that cash straight away. Cash is a very liquid form of an asset. When we talk about cash flow, we are talking about the movement of cash in and out of the business. So we're looking at the revenues coming in and the costs going out. Cash flow is important because it enables the business to see if it will have enough money in its bank to cover any costs. If it identifies periods of time when it may not have enough money in its bank or on the building site itself, then it could arrange maybe a source of finance like an overdraft to cover that problem. If a business does identify problem areas and it cannot find any sources of finance to cover short term problems in cash flow, then it may go bust. Lots of businesses actually cease trading because of cash flow, not because they don't have a good product, but because they don't have enough cash in the business to cover their outgoings. One important thing you must remember is that cash flow isn't the same as profit. Profit is calculated when we take into account all of the costs at the end of a business cycle. Cash flow is the day-to-day -day money that a business has to operate on. So let's have a look at some multiple choice questions. Now, multiple choice questions come in section A of both paper one and paper two. The finance questions will appear in paper two. The idea here is you will stop the video, answer the question, then check that you have got the correct answer. So the first question, Taj is a finance assistant. He works in a secondary school. Which of the following tasks would be done by Taj? A. Creating educational resources. B. 
keeping the school website up to date, C, producing reports on the school's GCSE results, or D, providing financial data on the school's energy usage. Now, the main task that someone working as a finance assistant in a school would be to provide financial data. In this case, it's on energy. In reality, they may well end up working on lots of other things. But the question is about finance. You need to select the finance answer. Black and Grow have given you some financial information. Their total revenue is £68,000. Their total labour costs are £26,000. Total material costs are £16,000 and other costs are £10,000. In 2018, Buck and Grow made A, a loss of £52,000, B, a loss of £42,000, C, a profit of £16,000, D, a profit of £26,000. The answer to this question is C, they made a profit of £16,000. You'd work that one out by taking the three different costs away from total revenue. So 68,000 minus 26 plus 16 plus 10. Transport costs of Global Logistics United for the last five years are shown below. The data shows that A, the company prefers transport its goods by air. B, the company's transport costs have fallen year on year. C, GLU PLC spent more than 1.25 million on transport costs in 2018. Or D, GLU PLC transports more goods by rail than by road. The answer to this question is C, the company spent more than 1.25 million on transport costs in 2018. The answer isn't A, because it says prefers to transport. We don't know how many items were sent by each of those methods. We just know that there was a certain amount spent on road, rail and air. Air travel is more expensive. They might not have sent more goods by air. It just costs more. B is wrong because if you just add them up, you can see that each year the costs have increased. And D is wrong, just like A is wrong, because we don't know how many goods were sent by rail than road. They could send more on road because it's cheaper. The finance department has forgotten to authorise the purchase of a large order of raw materials. Which of the following is not the a likely consequence of this? Now, this is a hybrid question between operations and finance. So it's expecting you to be able to link more than one department together. So is the answer A, more marketing will be needed? B, production may be delayed? C, sales will increase? Or D, storage costs will increase? The answer is B, production may be delayed. If finance haven't authorised the purchase of a large order of raw materials, that means the raw materials are likely not to be delivered. If there are no materials to make products, then production can't happen. This question, with an extract from Pasha's Carpets Cash Flow, wants you to calculate what the net cash flow will be. Now, there is no set formula for how a business needs to lay out its cash flow forecast. You will see different versions in the textbook, different versions in exam papers, different versions in revision guides and online. You basically need to remember that the opening balance is the amount of money in the bank at the beginning of the month. You then add in your inflows, remove your outflows, and you're left with a closing balance. If you can remember that sequence, it doesn't matter what the um, presentation of the cash flow looks like, 
you should be able to work out any gaps that they are. It is likely that you will be presented with a cash flow forecast with a blank somewhere for you to calculate. So Pasha's Carpet's net cash flow for August is expected to be A, minus 3,700, B, minus 1,500, C, 1,500, or D, 3,700. Stop the video, calculate the net cash flow, and then start to check your answer. So the answer is negative 1,500. If you start off with a negative balance, you add on the 44,000 and then you take away 4,500, that should leave you with a negative 1,500. Tin Soup Manufacturer is considering extending its product range to include fresh soups. Which of the following is not likely to encourage the shareholders to vote for this extension to the product range? Again, this is a question which sort of links marketing and finance together. So is the answer A, the opportunity to combine ingredient costs and make higher profits? B, the opportunity to gain a reputation for producing healthy meals? C, the opportunity to have more customers than other soup manufacturers? Or D, the opportunity to increase the financial risk of the business? Remember, the question says following is not likely. So the opportunity in, to increase the financial risk of the business is something that shareholders may not want to do. Exobike made a gross profit of £9,996 from selling 42 exercise bikes at £350 each. What is Exobike's gross profit margin? Now to calculate this, you would need to work out what the revenue from selling 42 exercise bikes at £350 each is, first of all, and then use the formula to work out the gross profit margin. So this is a two-step question. So the answer to this question is 68%. Step one, you'd multiply 42 exercise bikes by £350, which would give you 14,700. You would then divide 9,996 pounds by that 14,700 and multiply that answer by 100, which would give you a figure of 68%. Let's move on to section B. Now, section B has a range of different questions from one mark up to nine marks. They are all based upon a case study. You need to make sure that when asked, you use information from the case study to enable you to get marks. Some questions do not expect you to link directly to the case study, but if at any point you are confused as to whether or not you should be linking it, then try and use information from the case study that can help you guarantee those marks. So let's have a look at SP Dry Cleaners case study. Stuart and Pippa own a dry cleaning and laundrette business called SP Dry Cleaners. The pie charts below show the monthly variable costs in 2017 and 2018. And then you've got two pie charts which break down the information for you. Now, please be careful that you identify which pie chart is which. Quite often, students don't necessarily look at the years and then they use the wrong information to do the calculations. There is no guarantee that the exam board will put the oldest figures on the left and the newest figures on the right. It's up to you to make sure you're focused and see what data relates to what year. 
and let's look at the second part of the case study. Stuart and Pippa are looking to expand into clothing repair and have investigated two sewing repair businesses, HD Sewing and Fast Stitch, that are for sale. Pippa has stated she wants to see her investment in the sewing repair business returned within five years. Stuart has collected the following information on the two businesses. So you've got the purchase price, the sales revenue, the net profit, and one of the two average rate of return figures. That indicates that you're going to be asked to calculate the average rate of return. So the first question is identify one fixed cost a business could have. Now, as you can see, there is no mention of SP in the question. So this can be about any company. It's just showing that you understand what a fixed cost is. Stop the video and identify one possible fixed cost. So if you remember, fixed costs do not change with the level of output. I would recommend that you always start with rent. Insurance is another good one because insurance is fixed for the year, just like rent is fixed for the year. Salaries is the third option that I would choose because a salary is a set amount for the year, irregardless of how many hours that person who's on the salary works. This next question is explain what is meant by variable costs for two marks. Now this is another knowledge mark. It is not about a company. It could the company, it could be about any company. So it's asking for knowledge as opposed to showing understanding of the business. You've got two marks here, so that's indicating it needs to be a fairly decent sentence to make sure you have fully explained what variable costs are. Stop the video, have a go, and then come back and check to see if you've got it right. Now, as you can see from the mark scheme in front of you, there are two marks and you can see where they've been issued. It says one mark for identifying that variable cost change and one mark for linking it to output. So the exemplar variable costs are costs that change one mark as output slash sales changes the second mark the next question is calculate how much sp spent on wages in 2018 show your workings this is an application question because you are having to look at the case study and use that data to calculate your answer. Please note as well, it says show your workings. If you are 100% confident that you know the answer, then yes, by all means, go ahead and put an answer down. But if that's wrong, you've potentially thrown away all of the, the marks or both of the marks. If you show your workings and then you made an error in your calculation, you might pick up one of the two marks. So it is always a good idea to show your workings, especially when it's asked you to. Now, this is a question that relates to making sure you pick the right data. You've got two bits of information, 2017 and 2018. In the exam, a lot of candidates didn't bother to check which source of information was which and they used the wrong data to calculate their answers. Okay, so you get one mark for working out how much of the bill goes on wages in one month. So that's 35% of the 5,500 gives you a figure of 1,925. Most people who attempted this question and picked the right data set got as far as that. What they then didn't do was multiply it out to work out what that was for a year. 
you only have one month, you need to multiply that by 12 to come up with the data for the year. Let's have a look at an analyse question for three marks. Analyse one change in SP's dry cleaning chemical costs between 2017 and 2018. Refer to pie charts one and two in your answer. So there's one mark for application for using relevant information and two marks for analysis. So two separate explanations as to the effect on the business. Stop the video, give yourself three minutes to write your answer, then come back and check. Okay, so in terms of application, you have various different options and how you could pick up the mark. Identifying that there's £880 a month or £10,560 in a year in 2017, or going up to £1,100 a month, or if you calculated that through, 13,200 a year. That's or talk about an increase in two of 2,200 pounds a month or 2,640 pounds a year. You need to have done some calculation or some comparison to get the application marks. Analysis building on from that you need to so have identified that the costs have increased. However, the proportion has stayed the same. Your analysis could have developed the lines that they're paying more for the chemicals. However, the proportion of all variable costs has stayed the same. You could have taken a slightly different view in your answer. Maybe sales have gone up. If sales have gone up, that means the business has to purchase more dry cleaning chemicals. It might be due to the cost of chemicals increasing, leading the business to have to purchase more raw materials. Making sure you have used the data and analysed the impact for the business twice will give you the marks. We have a three mark calculation question. Calculate SP's average rate of return on the purchase of HD sewing. Show your workings. So this is an application question. Again, you're using data in your calculation, which is why it is a um, AO2 mark. You get one mark for calculating total income. You get one mark for calculating profit and then you get the third mark for calculating the average rate of return. Again, you could, if you are confident, just have put down the average rate of return mark and got all three marks. But if you made a mistake, you could end up having zero marks. If you show your workings at each step, then that will enable you to pick up marks, even if your final answer is wrong. Stop the um, video and have a go at this. This was one of the worst answered questions when this exam was um, sat. So it is worth spending time working out what the actual answer is and making sure you understand how to calculate average rate of return. Now to calculate average rate of return, you'd need to know how much money they were going to make over the five years. So that would be £25,000 multiplied by five, giving you £125,000. You then need to take away the cost of the initial investment, which gives you £45,000. You divide that £45,000 by five years, which gives you £9,000. And then the final stage is you divide that 9,000 by the initial 80,000 pound cost and multiply that by 100. The answer is 11.25. Please be aware that sometimes they will tell you how many decimal points to use. By default, you should always use two decimal points. Now you can see in this mark scheme, they're actually being quite flexible and allowing 
it to be rounded to 11.3 or rounded downwards to 11. That is not necessarily always going to be the case. So please make sure you know how many decimal places they're asking for. And if they don't say, always by default use two. You'll also notice that at the bottom of the screen, it's giving you an indication that you can pick up marks even if you've got it wrong and that we can do an own number rule provided you have detailed what the numbers are. If you don't do that and get it wrong, you get nothing. We're about to hit a series of three, three markers. Now, if you have watched the other videos, you will know that this is quite common with OCR and it's called scaffolding. They are basically breaking down a nine mark answer into three three mark questions. Normally, two analyze followed by a recommend. Now, the first question here is analyze one reason why SP should buy HD sewing. Refer to data from table one in your answer. There is a AO1B understanding mark where you should be explaining why a business would want to buy another one. The application mark comes from using numerical data from the case study. Now, this is a finance question. It's asking you to use numerical data. You will not get marks on a finance question for just talking about other aspects. It has to be numerical data from the case study. And then finally, AO3A analysis. What's the impact of that purchase on SP? Stop the video, spend three minutes writing your answer, then come back and check against the mark scheme. So understanding why a business might want to buy another one. It could be for growth, could be increased profit, increased income, increased return on investment, could be to help meet the objectives of the business, reducing average costs, economies of scale, could be to enter a new market. Application here, if you look at those bullet points, it is using numerical information. So it's talking about the sales revenue figure. It's talking about the net profit figure. It's talking about the net profit margin. And it talks about how the return on the investment will happen in a period of years. Analysis means that the business will gain more sales if they purchase HD. They will get a higher net profit. That means SP will benefit with its overall costs being contained. The net profit margin would increase, indicating the business is more efficient. Stuart and Pippa would gain more annual profit than by purchasing a different business. Look at the exemplar down at the bottom. HD has a better annual net profit than Fast Stitch by £3,000. So you get the understanding mark when we're talking about the profit figure, and then you get the application mark because they've used data for the £3,000. Which means that it is likely to be more successful business and Stuart and Pippa will be able to pay themselves a bigger income. That's the final impact mark. Now let's look at the second analyze question in this scaffolded series of three. Analyze one reason why SP should buy fast stitch. Refer to the data from table one in your answer. So this is exactly the same question that you had previously, but about the second company. So the same rules about understanding application and analysis apply. Please have a go at this question. Remembering in this case, the biggest difference is going to be coming from the application element. 
So let's have a look at the mark scheme. We don't need to worry about um, the understanding because that's the same reasons that we've covered on the previous slide. Application this time, the application, the uh, purchase price is lower. It has a better average rate of return and the return on investment will happen in less than three years. Analysis, less money is needed. Less money could mean less risk, but it still means the business can grow. Now, if we look at the exemplar at the bottom, Fast Stitch has a better average rate of return than HD. That's your understanding mark of 13% compared to 11%. That's your application mark. This means that SP will gain more profit compared to the cost. That is the um, final analysis mark. Now, before we move on from this, one important thing to focus on. If you look at the top right hand side of the mark scheme, it says one mark for understanding the reasons for buying a business. If you don't get that understanding in, you can't get any further marks. So it is really important with an analyze question that you show your understanding. And finally, in this sequence of three, we have the recommend question, another three marks. Recommend whether SP should buy HD sewing or fast stitch to expand their business. Refer to data from table one to support your judgment. Now, if you have looked at the other videos in this series, you will know that recommend questions are really simple to get the marks through, but you must follow a pattern. First of all, you need to say which company SP should buy. It doesn't matter which one, but you should say HP should buy, so SP should buy, and then that's it, you get a mark. You get a follow-up mark if you explain why. So SB should buy, whatever, because. And then the third mark comes for putting your justification into the context of the case study. So again, three minutes, write your answer, then check against the mark scheme. So let's have a look at the exemplars. It is clear that SB should buy FS. That's it. They've made the recommendation. Gives you one mark. Because Pippa is more concerned about the return on her investment than any other factor. That links it to the case study. It also is analysis. Moving on, and FS has the highest average rate of return. Now that is the mark that you get for application here. It would be better if they'd actually used the data. They haven't. This exemplar is showing the minimum expectation. I would recommend you use numbers in a recommend question that involves finance. Second example, SB should buy HD, so that's the decision, the recommendation, because Stuart and Pippa as business owners want to make as much profit as possible, that's the analysis bit there, and HD as the higher annual net profit, that's the application. Again, if it was me, I would be putting the actual net profit figures in there, just to show the examiner that you are confident in using the case study for your answer. That is it for this video. Please make sure you have completed the knowledge organizer. Please make sure you have practiced your formula. Please make sure that you have used other resources to make sure you fully understand this particular theme. Thank you very much. Goodbye.